But we have saved maybe the best for, less, for last here. We've got some very good speakers, and we've got three of them here. So we want to give them adequate time to talk. Uh, first up here is Dr. Horter Christensen, um, a longtime colleague of mine, and um, uh, formerly at uh, University of Florida, graduated from uh, University of Massachusetts, PhD, MS from uh, Washington, University, University of Washington, yep. Seattle, yeah. And now uh, Chief Science and Innovation Officer at Matisse. Do I pronounce Matisse right? Uh, it is Matisse, right? I've heard it about 14 ways. It's pretty close, I, yeah. What do you say? Matisse. Matisse, right. Oh, Matisse. <laughs> at Matisse, which yeah, used to be the, I guess, the Icelandic Fisheries Development Laboratories. So a uh, wide range of experience and background, and we're looking forward to his talk on toward full utilization. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a, uh, tell you a little bit about Matis, which is a fairly young research and development company in Iceland, um, uh, founded in about, uh, in uh, actually 2006, but we started in 2007. And uh, this is the reason I went back to, to, or back to Iceland. I still have a lot of uh, things going on here in the U.S. I'm still an adjunct at, at the university. But Matis, uh, we were actually three uh, public research institutes that merged into one, and then one private biotech company. So we're actually owned by the government. But we're still independent, so the government can't really uh, fiddle with our business. And we only get about 25% of our operating income from the government. Everything else is contract research, competitive grant funding, and, and so forth. So we're quite, quite independent. And we, are, we exist in Iceland to enhance innovation in both food and biotech. Uh, we are here to help, to help the industry in Iceland, increase the value of the products. We have a food safety role. We're not the FDA, but we do a lot of analysis, uh, micro and chemical analysis. We do a lot of consumer uh, work. And we pretty much do the whole gamut from basic research to uh, commercial applications. And recently we've gone more into uh, contract research because we're actually way too big for Iceland. Um, we're a small country. Iceland is a, small, it's a huge island but a small country. We're actually almost exactly the size of Kentucky, so you can kind of visually see how, how, how small or big we are depending on how you view Kentucky. But we're spread out all over the country. Uh, so we have stations that are very close to, the, to, to different industries, especially, of course, the fishing industry in Iceland because we have different types of fishing industries in different, part, different parts of the country, and it's very important to have people there that stay in touch with what going on, what's going on in the industry, and then they can feed it to our main labs where we can help, uh, help them develop their industry uh, uh, forward. And we have now about 110 sci scientists and engineers. And for a country of 330,000 people, that's actually quite, quite big. So we're way too big for Iceland. And in fact, our income now is almost 50% from outside funding, uh, external funding from outside of uh, Iceland, working with companies and, and universities and institutes all over the world now. We, like I said, we're quite global now. Um, we, we work with everybody from the individual entrepreneur that wants to develop a product to really big companies. So one of our biggest clients now is actually PepsiCo. We've done a lot of projects with Nestle, Roquette, and Roche. So we're from food and, and, and to biotech. Uh, so we kind of we have a very broad uh, collaboration, a broad network of companies that we that we work with, and we're also a incubator. Uh, we see ourselves as a bridge between industry and academia. So we have startup companies that actually, some of them we actually have ownership in, and, and our people also have ownership in the startup companies because they're the entrepreneurs. We actually allow people, our our, our staff, to start companies, and Matis has a, has a partial ownership in, and the entrepreneurs will have a partial ownership in. But then we have a lot of different smaller uh, private companies that have ac access to our facilities and they, uh, uh, they have their own labs, they have their own offices, and they, they mingle with our people. They eat lunch with us, they eat breakfast with us, so there's a lot of intellectual mingling uh, going on between uh, the Matis people and those companies. And we also have a link to the, to the university. Uh, and this is a very unique model because I came from, the, came from academia, I was a professor at the University of Florida. Uh, what happened in Iceland uh, six years ago, we saw the food science program basically going down. We had a handful of students, but we're a food producing nation. So we, and Matis, for us it was a big warning sign because we also need people and we need to make sure our industry is well educated. So we teamed up with the university and we actually redesigned the, the, the program, the food science program. So Matis did. It was actually outsourced to Matis. And we teach everything at Matis. We have the labs, we have the classrooms. And about 50 of our people are actually teaching in, in, in undergraduate and graduate courses. And we went from a handful of students, and we have now about, about 80 students, actually, in the food science program. Bachelors, masters, and PhD, which is quite a lot for a very small, small country. And <clears throat> what's important in, that pro in the program is that 
all the master's uh, projects, all the PhD project, projects, they have an industry component. So you have the basic research, but there is an industry participant. So they're kind of like industry PhDs and industry, industry masters. So right now we have about uh, uh, 30 students in, uh, in addition to our uh, 110 scientists and engineers at Matis. And we also have a big internship program. We get interns from all over the world from three to six to nine months. And right, I think this, this year we had about 40 or 50 interns actually working at, at Mati. So it's a very dynamic kind of environment to work in. And as you can imagine, the bulk of our work is uh, marine resources, because we do, we do everything, but the marine resources are the most important to, uh, uh, to Iceland. Now, we go even further, and we're also a part of the United Nations University. I don't know if you know about this, this program. There's a program run by the United Nations where we actually get people from the developing countries, and they do a six-month, very intensive program in fisheries management, food quality, food safety, processing, and then they have a specialty, and they do a specialty uh, uh, project, and then they go back to their home countries, and they, uh, you know, hopefully they, they, they know a little bit more about the, uh, the, the seafood industry. And again, mostly from the developing countries and about 20 to 30 people every, every year. And we, we do the whole seafood quality and seafood safety uh, and, and processing program for the United Nations uh, University. So that's a little bit about Matis. I don't want to spend too much time on Matis, but what we're really about, all about in Matis now is uh, we're about the bioeconomy. I'm sure you've heard that word. Uh, countries have their own bioeconomy policies. The US has a bioeconomy policy. Canada has one, one of the first countries. And we just this year, actually, this month, we're planning on launching the Icelandic bioeconomy policy. And what I mean by bioeconomy is really just utilizing our resources as efficiently as possible, uh, getting zero waste, ending up with zero waste, and also making some money at the same time, because we, we want it to be a profitable industry. And these are the grand challenges, at least the way, uh, the way we see it in Europe. It's food security, alternative energy solutions, because the old, old economy is the fossil economy. We want to move from the fossil economy to a to a green, fossil-free economy eventually, uh, global warming, and then the changing uh, demographics, because people are getting older, and I th we think the marine uh, resources and marine ingredients can really help our, 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 our older generations being, having preventative effects, health effects that can help us grow uh, happily and, and, and healthfully uh, you know, ever after. But so I just wanted to, one thing, uh, the bioeconomy is a term that I know a lot of people don't, don't think about it, and, and, and we have kind of an image problem. It's a, it's a big deal in Europe now. Everybody's putting together bioeconomy policies. In Iceland, we're putting a huge emphasis on the blue bioeconomy, which, which is the marine bioeconomy. And uh, what we've done, one problem is people don't know what it's, what it's all about, so we actually put together a little video to tell people what the bioeconomy is all about. And I want to show you the video, and I hope this works. I think this is a mouse. at least part of the video. The bioeconomy is the part of our economy that depends on biological resources. It includes food and feed production, as well as other industries that are directly or indirectly based on the utilization of renewable biological resources. The bioeconomy is a foundation for a future in which societies rely on renewable and sustainable resources to meet needs for energy, chemicals, and raw materials, replacing today's use of non-renewable resources. The bioeconomy will therefore reduce the negative environmental impact of industries and create a basis for sustainable future societies. Bioresources are found in oceans, freshwater, farmed lands, forests, and in the wilderness. Human resources are needed to build industries that will increase the value of sustainably utilized biomass across sectors with improved processes, innovation, new products, and services. The development of these industries is in fact the development of the bioeconomy. The backbone of a strong bioeconomy is sustainable utilization, supporting education, and innovation capacity. The blue bioeconomy is the bioeconomy of oceans and freshwater. If managed in a sustainable manner, it is an important source of healthy food, feed, and bioactive compounds. Most people associate the ocean with fishing, but there is more than meets the eye. From each cod caught, it is typical to use the fillet and head for human consumption. The products can be fresh, frozen, dried, salted, or otherwise processed to meet specific consumer needs. In the past, the rest of the fish has typically been considered waste. 
Intestines, bones, and skin have been thrown away with additional costs, causing negative impact on the environment. This practice is changing rapidly as industries are realizing that side streams from the fishing industry should be seen as a resource rather than waste, and that there is significant additional value to be made from each caught fish. In Iceland, great emphasis is put on sustainable resource management as well as optimized utilization of each caught fish. Typically 75 to 80% of each cod caught is used for value creation, which is high in comparison to other countries, but can still be improved. Collaboration of research and industries has created important new value streams from what has previously been thrown away. From fish skin, companies are making high fashion textiles snacks for human consumption, and even medical products for skin regeneration, all from raw material previously thrown away. We can also take the example of fish frames. By processing fish frames in biorefineries, companies are currently making bioactive compounds that can be used for food supplements, pharmaceuticals, medical and cosmetic products. Fish frames can also be used to produce fertilizers for agricultural use, and as feed for microorganisms that produce biodegradable plastics, biofuels, or feed for aquaculture. Bioresources are typically located in rural areas. Biomass, especially aquatic biomass, is a vulnerable material that spoils over time and is expensive to relocate. These characteristics give communities in rural areas a competitive advantage when it comes to the development of new bio-based industries. The development of bio-based industries can therefore be a key in addressing rural community challenges, such as the aging population, gender imbalance, depopulation, and lack of diversity in the job market. Young adults, especially educated young women, choose not to return after obtaining a higher education, often due to lack of diversity and appealing jobs for people with higher education. Strengthening the bioeconomy and developing new bio-based industries that call for an educated workforce in close proximity to bioresources is proving to be a good tool in strengthening social and economic growth in rural areas. The Nordic countries have made a holistic approach to the bioeconomy with a goal to make the countries leading in the field of sustainable production and utilization of living natural resources for the purpose of reducing waste and promote innovation, green economy, and regional development. So, it tells you a little bit about the bioeconomy. I hope you understand our concept. But this is really, this is really what we are, uh, sorry, I was trying to get back. This is really what we're all about uh, at Matis. We're really about advancing the, uh, the bioeconomy, not just the Icelandic bioeconomy, but, but the bioeconomy in uh, in general, and what what I mean by that is that we want no waste, and that's why this is called uh, you know towards uh, full utilization, because that's what we want. That's what we want to end up with is is throwing absolutely nothing away when it comes to the comes to the food value chain. So the facts when we're dealing with uh, uh, with the oceans, uh, as you know, the over seventy percent of the Earth's surface is covered by water, but we're only con taking about four percent of the global food production from from the ocean, and about three point seven percent of that or of, of the total, uh, I'm sorry, 3.7 is going towards human consumption. But 10% uh, of, of that material actually is, uh, is we're getting 10% of the protein actually that we're consuming globally actually from that 3.7%. So it's quite a significant source of protein. And for certain countries, it's a very significant source of protein. But it's a very inefficient value chain. Uh, the biomass lost at sea, and we, we've studied this actually quite a bit, uh, can be... Uh, 8% on average. In the EU, it's actually 20 to 60%. The fin fish discards, it's, it's, it's horrific uh, how, how high it is. And we're not part of the EU. Iceland, actually, we don't have those numbers because uh, we, uh, we, we believe we're doing things a little bit more sustainably. And then utilization of fin fish can be anywhere from 30 to 75%. You know, we're utilizing our cod close to 80% now, but we're seeing some countries being as low as 30, 30%. And common, commonly, you see 40%. And then, of course, we know about the waste at retail and at the consumer level, 35% at least. So only about 21% of what comes aboard a vessel is actually ends up on uh, consumed by humans. So it's a very inefficient uh, value chain that we really need, to, really need to fix. And even though we've actually done a lot in Iceland and we think we've, we, uh, we're you know, among the best, we 
we didn't used to be. We used to, we used to be hor horrible polluters when it came to fishing. We used to catch a lot of fish, and we used to treat the fish absolutely horribly. Only, uh, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, our, our industry was, was not good, not at all. And these are, these are typical pictures you would see, you know, that we would catch so much fish, you, you didn't even have uh, a place to cool them, you didn't even have a place to, to store them properly, so you would, they, would go, they would spoil and we would turn them into possibly fish meal or fertilizer. So absolutely huge amount of waste. Now, through research and development, we have advanced uh, tremendously. So now, um, <clears throat> through improved harvesting techniques, uh, resource management to uh, improve chilling technologies, uh, uh, even simple things as developing special tubs that can keep the fish cold. We have really advanced the fishing industry um, in Iceland. And I think this, this gives a really good idea where, how we've developed the industry. In 1981, not, not very long time ago, we were catching uh, 460,000 tons. This is cod. We were only making, at current value, 340 uh, a million US dollars. Right now, we're only catching 180,000 tons, but we're making twice as much. And the reason is our yields have just gone up tremendously. The quality of our products have gone up tremendously. And we're seeing all these side industries that are developing from uh, the seafood industry that are making really high value uh, products. So, and you can only do that by really investing in research and development. And so the government really understood, understood that. Uh, this is another graph more recent showing that, you know, the, fish, the fishing catch has gone down slightly, uh, but the prices have actually gone up uh, gone up significantly. And the reason is improved quality of the product and also all these different side products that have really high, high value. And I don't think there's any coincidence that in 2003 we actually established this fund here in Iceland. It's called Added Value Seafood Fund. And it funds specifically research on, uh, on uh, you know, basically improving uh, seafood, uh, quality of seafood products, uh, developing new processes, developing new industries, new ingredients and so forth. And after that, we've seen a big jump, actually, in, uh, in, in, the, in the seafood industry in, uh, in Iceland. Now, we've also some more recent examples. Uh, mackerel, for example. Uh, we didn't have mackerel in Iceland. So suddenly, in the, in the mid-2000s, we got just swarms of mackerel moving up to Iceland, which was because of global warming. And we're actually in a, a mackerel war with, uh, with, uh, with Nor Norway and the Faroes and Scotland because they claim they own the mackerel, but, but they're in our waters. So we, we actually don't have an allocated quota for mackerel, but we set our own quota. But we try to do it responsibly. So in 2009, basically almost all the mackerel uh, went to fish meal and oil, over 80, or about 80%, which is horrible. Because this is a beautiful fish. You can really create wonderful products for, uh, from it. So we put together a, a major research effort, research and development effort, to figure out how we can create higher value products for mackerel. What we were doing back then, we, we didn't have the proper cooling techniques on board the ships. So it almost all went to, into fish meal. So we developed new cooling technologies. And this is all because of added research and funding, uh, commitment by the, by the government. And now we're at less than 5% fish meal. So it's almost all going towards human consumption. So what's happening now, we're also seeing some side industries developing, biotech industries that are going to do something with the byproducts. There's one company starting now, starting to develop uh, omega-3 oils from, from the mackerel. So it's going to develop even, even further. And this happened in very few years, but it, it couldn't have happened unless we had actually money, research funds, and we supported our, uh, our, our institutes and universities to, to actually solve, solve the problem. And you can see, see here also the value, how the export value has just gone up exponentially here. And this is because we just went from fish meal into the human food, uh, food market. Uh, other simple things we've done in Iceland is uh, very simple things like packaging, te packaging technology. Uh, by simply modifying, these are just, you know, we, we have about two, two or three hundred projects running at Matis now. I want to show you a few, few examples. But just changing the traditional uh, styrofoam box to uh, edges like this, uh, you can actually extend the shelf life substantially of, of, of the product because you don't lose the energy from the, from the sides of the box. It sounds very simple, but it actually took a PhD project to, 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 to figure that out. And now this product is actually sold, it's sold all over. This is the standard product now on the market uh, for shipping fresh products uh, uh, in, in styrofoam boxes. So what happened, because of this development, uh, at one time we were actually shipping a lot with, much more with, uh, with air freight versus uh, container boats into Europe and into the US. But because of the new technology, you can keep the fish cooler longer. You can actually move more of that fish through uh, container boats into, into the Euro European market, saving tremendously on, uh, on oil. So it's a much better uh, carbon, carbon footprint. 
small things can make a really big difference. Another thing we've also been doing, we're mapping out our, uh, our fishing areas. So we're trying to map them out and understand where we can get the best quality fish. Uh, the highest yields, the fewest worms, fewest pin bones, less gaping and so forth. So we've actually mapped out all the fishing areas so we know where we can catch fish that has this much yield and, and this amount of ringworms and things like that. So we can optimize our, our fishing so we can be more, we can do more responsible fishing. And then we're also trying to educate the consumer. Like, like we try to do with the video on bioeconomy, uh, we're, we've developed an app that you can actually bring to the supermarket so you can know everything about your fish, if you want to know everything about your fish, so, and including recipes and, and things like that. But you can even see the picture of the boat that was caught, and we can even go to the extreme of showing the fishermen that actually, if you want to show the fishermen that actually caught, caught the boat. So, so this is something we, it's, it's important to educate the consumer, and, because the consumer wants to be connected to their, to their food. Now, I want to move into uh, the bioactive product, uh, spend a little time on that, because we have, this is a big program we have at Matis, uh, finding ways to actually produce higher value from byproducts. And we have, of course, all of these ingredients we can develop from, uh, uh, from byproducts. And we have all these different applications that we can use those ingredients for. But I wanted to uh, talk about, uh, maybe skip to this. This is really what we're trying to do with the industry in Iceland. The industry has traditionally been here as a raw ingredient processor or maybe going into semi-refined ingredients. We really want to help the industry, I'm trying to wake you up here, guys, try to, try to move the industry into the finished consumer products. This is where you can create a lot of value, but they really also need market know-how and sales, sales know-how. So we, with cod, I mentioned that 75 to 80% of the cod is now uh, being actually utilized. And we've seen, cod is a very good example of how you can advance advance the seafood industry. So right now you're producing all of these different products from this, this animal. We still have the 25 to 20 percent that we need to utilize, mostly the, mostly the guts and some of the, some of the bones. And we've actually done some projects with the black soldier flies actually with the, with the fish guts. So we have a facility growing, very small facility where we've grown the black soldier flies. Yeah. <laughs> so, so giving you some examples of what we've done with the byproducts. You know, you know this. This is liver, fish liver. Uh, traditional products, fish, fish oil. Nothing very exciting. But what's, what we've seen, what we've actually developed with some companies in the last few years, we've developed an extra virgin fish oil. Okay, so it's it's actually cold pressed and it's marketed as an extra virgin oil. Very high premium. Has a different smell, different flavor, but it's very high in certain ben certain beneficial fatty acids that Holly's going to talk about. So I, I won't take that away from you. And then we also have companies in Iceland that are develop medical products from, uh, uh, from, the, from the oil. This is a company that develops uh, um, skin creams for people with psoriasis and other skin, skin problems. This company is very interesting. They started out developing eye drops to help with, with eye disease, omega-3 eye drops. But the consumers didn't use it because it smelled too bad. So they had to, ship, had to change their business program, and now they're selling uh, suppositories with, with uh, fish oils. So they're in phase two clinical trials. It helps you uh, if you're congested. It actually helps you, uh, yeah, you know, gets things moving. So, but that's that's made made from uh, made from fish oil. And then we have the buy, uh, the trimmings. And there are a few companies in Iceland doing something with the trimmings, uh, not just drying them and selling them for pet food or or or, or shipping them dried to Africa, which is a big market for some of our, our, our trimmings. But there are companies that are extracting protein from the from the trimmings. And one company has already launched. Uh, these peptide products, these are protein hydrolysates that are developed from cod. First they extract the proteins, then they hydrolyze them into uh, and, and fractionate them into these, these different peptide products. They just launched, uh, launched this year. Uh, much higher value than obviously the, the, the starting, starting raw material. And fish skins, the video talked about fish skins. Uh, we have an industry in Iceland where we, we produce leather from fish skin. I'm sure some of you have seen fish skin leather. It's actually the strongest leather you can get, stronger than uh, in cowhide. And you can get very interesting designs depending on the, on the type of fish you use. Then there are companies now starting to make uh, collagen from uh, f fish skin, or collagen hydrolysates. And then this company here is probably the most innovative of all, all of them that, that's uh, utilizing fish skin. So anybody know what this is? Looks like Band-Aids, right? It's exactly, kind of exactly what it is. But it's actually a, let me go back, because it's actually a uh, piece of skin that helps you regrow skin. You don't turn into a mermaid, though, when you, when you use it, but, <laughs> but don't worry. But it actually, yeah, people, you know, burn victims, people that have uh, diabetes, they get chronic, uh, wound, uh, chronic uh, uh, sores when they lie in, uh, people that lie in bed for a long time and get chronic, chronic wounds. This, this is competing with the only product on the market, which is uh, pig skin intestines. So they developed this. They have certain patents now on it. It's very expensive. One little 
patch like this costs about three, four hundred dollars, but they're covered by Medicaid and Medicare in the U.S. So you can, you can create a substantial amount of value from, from one fish skin. And we developed a prototype at Matis, and then they, they took over. They actually were in our, they, they kind of came up from, a, it, was, it was not a Matis spin-off, but they, they used our facilities to develop the product. And it's amazing what it does. They, 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 they strip off the allergens from the fish skin, they leave some of the omega-3s, but then they leave, they leave the collagen matrix, and the collagen matrix actually acts as a scaffolding for skin cells to grow on. So they will attach to the collagen matrix, and they will start making new skin, and then it just dissolves in your body. So it's, yeah, it's amazing. And it's, it's substantial value creation. Uh, we have companies using uh, the fish guts, also in Iceland. Actually, a company has been doing it since the 1980s. And what they did, they developed, they extract enzymes from the fish guts. Uh, chymotrypsin, trypsin, and elastase, those are the same enzymes we find in our pancreas. And they developed this skincare product for people with psoriasis and eczema, very successful. They went, ventured into the conventional uh, cosmetic market into Europe, did really well. But then they had a blockbuster uh, two years ago. This one right here, Coldzyme. It's not available in the US, it's available in, in, in Europe. Uh, it's actually clinically proven to reduce the duration of the common cold. So once you find you, you're getting a cold, you spray it in your mouth, and the, the enzymes actually, they, they create, first of all, the enzymes create a um, kind of a film on your mucous, mucous membrane in your, in your mouth, and they actually break down the cold, cold virus. So they have clinical studies showing that. And they just sold the company for I don't know how much money. And this was a university spin-off. It took, it took them about 20, 25 years, actually, to reach that level. I, I mean, you guys know this. When you're in biotech, that's sometimes how, how long it takes. You really have to, uh, to be, have to have thick skin to really survive, the, survive in this industry. Now, and then the shrimp shells. Um, we actually, 20, 30 years ago in Iceland, it was a huge environmental problem. We caught a lot of shrimp. It was all dumped into landfills or dumped at sea. I remember as a kid, I could see it floating around in the, in the sea. It was just, just disgusting. But then they put a legislation uh, uh, through, through our parliament saying you, can't, you have to do something with the shrimp, shrimp shell. You, you can't just discard it. So two companies came out of that uh, uh, regu regulatory change, one called Primex, one called Genis. Primex produces kytosan from, from the shell, and they're very successful. And one of their biggest clients is actually the US Army, because it's used in wound dressings. It's a very good wound. Uh, it's for anti-inflammatory properties. It, it heals, uh, heals wounds and, uh, and, has, is, uh, and it has multiple benefits. It's antibacterial, for example. So that's one of the biggest client. They also sell it as a cream for people that have chronic wounds. And then they're also selling it as a slimming agent. Although I have to say the clinical data doesn't really support that Cattison is a very good slimming agent, but they're selling, I think, doing pretty well still on that market. The other company, Genis, uh, they're just now commercial. It took them about 18 years to become commercial, and they produce what's called chyto oligosaccharides, and they're utilizing one of the enzymes that we develop at Matis, and I haven't even told you about that. We have a whole, we have an enzyme program at Matis working with extremophiles from Icelandic geothermal uh, areas. Uh, you probably know Iceland is very geothermally active, and we're actually we're actually, we actually have the most microbial diversity in the world. Uh, we're, we're like the Amazon of the microbes in Iceland because of all the different geothermal habitats we have. So we have a program of 20 people working on that. So they use our enzyme and they modify the chitosan and the chitin. They break it up into what's called oligosaccharides, smaller uh, units, and they sell it as a supplement, <clears throat> as an anti-inflammatory supplement, uh, people with bone issues and, and, and joint issues. But their biggest uh, bet is, the, is, is this, actually using it in bone regeneration. People that have broken bones, you would actually inject the chyto oligosaccharides into the broken bone. And just like the fish skin, it works as a scaffolding. So the bone cells start migrating towards it and starts building a new bone structure to heal your bone naturally with a natural uh, uh, ingredient. So that's coming out soon, I think. And then we have the seaweed. Uh, seaweed is a... Uh, huge resource in not just Iceland, but Norway and, and, and the Faroes and even Greenland. But in Iceland, it's a very underutilized resource. We have several million metric tons of seaweed and we're harvesting about 19,000 tons. So it has a tremendous potential. But just like with seaweed and with cod, we, we don't know a lot about you know, how the seaweed regenerates. So we really have to do a lot of basic work how to properly harvest seaweed so we, we, we re regrow it. But we do have a couple of spin-offs uh, from Matis. Marinox is developing uh, antioxidative extracts and anti-inflammatory extracts from, uh, from a particular seaweed, very rich in polyphenols. 
And Una is, actually, is a cosmetic product already on the market that's utilizing those extract. And uh, we have a user in the room right here, right? You, you would promote Una, right? Yes, so. <laughs> Yeah, so seaweed has really unique, has really unique properties uh, we're still studying. And we, we haven't done clinical studies on it yet, but people that are using this product, they actually tell us that they don't get the herpes virus anymore, the cold source. So it seems to have an antiviral effect, but we don't have any clinical data, so we can't really claim, claim anything on that. And another company just came out, this one in Iceland, uh, using a different process. And then we have a company that's processing uh, 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 sea minerals, so called uh, Celtic Sea Minerals. They produce aquamine. It's a very uh, well-known ingredient in the marketplace, especially here in the U.S. It's a calcified seaweed. So they actually harvest about 80,000 tons of calcified seaweed, and they produce it into, uh, process it into a food ingredient, pharma, uh, pharma, pharma filler ingredient, pet food ingredient. Uh, they use a lot, lot of it for cow feed. And then also in, uh, uh, in, in drinks now, they have a soluble form of the aquamine. And lately, we've also ventured into microalgae. Uh, we have our own natural microalgae in Iceland. You may have heard of the Blue Lagoon, if you've ever been there or, or heard of Iceland. It's one of our biggest tourist attractions. They have their own natural microalgae growing in the lagoon that they then produce a variety of different uh, cosmetic products from. And then we've had two companies just starting, starting in Iceland. This one is backed up by U.S. investors. They have a big-scale production of astaxanthin, uh, which is it's not a local uh, algae, but we have the perfect conditions to grow algae in Iceland because we have a lot of geothermal energy, we have a lot of CO2 coming from, coming from, the, uh, coming from the earth, and we also have a lot of very cheap electricity to keep, keep everything lighted. So it's a good place to grow, grow macroalgae. And lastly, um, I want to mention there's a lot of opportunities also between sectors here, and this is one example. And I love the, the, the soldier fly examples because that's, I mean, that's really, it's a, it's a beautiful way of how you're, taking a byproduct or a waste product and you're actually turning it into food eventually. We're doing the same thing with our friends in Sweden. We have had a big project going on now that's becoming commercial uh, where you're actually converting wood into food, but indirectly. So what we have in Sweden, they had a huge problem. They're a big wood producing country, obviously. You've got IKEA, which uses a lot of wood. I mean, it's a huge, they have huge forests in Sweden. And they had a waste stream. Uh, this is a paper and pulp factory. They had a very toxic waste stream that they had to get a, had to somehow fix the waste stream and so we came in and we, we grew filamentous fungi on the waste stream. And the filamentous fungi produce single cell protein. I mean, it, it's an old technology. It's not a new technology. We, we, people have been doing this on oil for, for decades, but not, not on this waste stream. Though. And the single cell protein is a wonderful uh, feed for, uh, uh, for various fish. And we tested it on tilapia. We tested it on uh, Arctic char salmon. This is Arctic char. And then you, this is a way to convert wood or actually a problem in the wood in industry into a, into a food product. It's, it's sort of in a similar way as the, as the uh, uh, soldier flies. And I have, uh, I've eaten the fish with quite a few of my colleagues and we're still, I guess we're kind of okay, or maybe not, I don't know, but we're still alive. So, so there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with the fish. It actually, it's, the fish is, fish is perfect. So I think my time is up and I will open the floor for any questions that you may have about Matis, Iceland. Okay. That's good. I want to give you a heads up. Good. Uh, a lot of these uh, biorefinery processes are driven by the cost of energy uh, yep. to some extent. Uh, how much is a kilowatt hour on average on Iceland uh, of electricity? Oh, I can't remember that. It was a few, few cents. Yeah. yeah, everywhere yeah. is a few cents, yeah, 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 but, but it it's in the be lower. two or well, seven. The, the, re mean. the reason I can't answer that is because the, the national, uh, we have a national company that's running the whole grid in Iceland, and they have different grades. depends on the industry. So it's very hard. To, I mean, the aluminum industry gets a huge discount. So we have, basically, we have three industries in Iceland. We have the fishing industry, which used to be the biggest industry, but now it's actually number three in Iceland. Can you imagine what number one is in Iceland now? Tourism is number one, yes, and it's growing just like this. I mean, it's unbelievable, the tourism. When I, 
when I went back to Iceland, I think when, when they, Matis got me in 2008, uh, I think we had like five or 600,000 tourists. Next year, we're going to have like 2.8 million. Or something. I mean, it's just, it's, it's mind boggling. So, so you guys are all over the place. I go into my downtown Reykjavik and, you know, I'm amongst Americans, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm a minority in my own country, really. Is the Blue Lagoon big enough? We don't go to the Blue Lagoon, by the way. It's, it's just for tourists. So, but, but anyways, to answer his question is that the industries, they get very different uh, rates. And the second biggest industry is the heavy industries, aluminum, smeltering, and we have uh, silica processing. And they get different rates. We actually don't know the rates of those industries. But, um, so it's, it's, it's a few cents, but it's a range of a few cents. But the, but the energy company is actually planning on increasing the rates uh, 30 to 40 percent. And that's really scaring off a lot of... Uh, companies and we're, we're afraid it's going to scare off investors coming in and building like microalgae facilities. Uh, but we do have, um, I, I didn't even mention some of the aquaculture. The aquaculture industry is also growing in Iceland. We're still fairly small. We have uh, a pen industry which collapsed, has collapsed twice over the last 20 years. They're building up again. They're only about 10, 12,000 tons now. But we also have uh, warm water aquaculture in Iceland. We have a company growing tilapia, but then we have a very profitable company growing Senegal flounder, which is a very expensive fish sold in the European restaurants, and they're utilizing runoff water from one of the power plants. So, so yeah, that's one way of utilizing our excess heat. Yeah, um, some of, a number of the ideas that you mentioned were, were ideas or things you've seen in the literature for a number of years. And what I'm wondering is, how are you being so successful at going from these scientific ideas to actually successfully commercializing them? Okay, good question. I think part of it is just doing it. I mean, we kind of have a just do it attitude. And if you fail, you just do it again. <laughs> and you may fail again, and you do it again. But I mean, that, that's one, one part of it. That's kind of the, uh, I mean, we're, uh, you know, we're, I'm, I'm not bragging about my Icelanders. I mean, we're kind of strange people sometimes because we're, I mean, we're vi Vikings. We still have the Viking genes. We're still the, on the final, it's kind of, we're, we're frontiers people, yeah. So we kind of have that attitude. It's a little careless sometimes, I have to say, because we also you know, do stupid things that completely make no sense. But we have a very, uh, we also have a very good infrastructure, like companies like Matis, that are there to support the, the industry. And we have funds. We actually have research funds in Iceland and in Europe that really support food science research. And I know that's become a big problem in the, in the US. I remember when I left academia, well, I haven't quite left academia, but when I went to Iceland in 2008, uh, the funding was kind of drying, drying up here. Isn't that right? Yes. yes. And seafood funding. Oh, my God. We actually, when I moved to Iceland, I, I couldn't believe it. The seafood funding was going up. And the seafood funding in Euro Europe is actually going up. They have special blue initiatives now in Europe to develop seafood research and, and development. Not just safety, but actually safety is hard to get research funding for in, in Iceland. But quality and processing is easy to get research funding. And developing new innovative ingredients that so actually develop money. Iceland. <laughs> no, no, you can stay here. I, I need the money here. For but, so, so yeah, that's that's. So we we have the infrastructure, we have the government support, but one thing I, I have to mention: the industry is actually very much involved in these efforts. So these spin-off companies, these biotech companies, they have the industry support, and they kind of the industry is developing with these companies, and that's critical to have big seafood companies actually participate in in, in this development because you can't do it separately. You got to do it all together. That's one of the advantages of being a small country. Yes, um, I was f had worked at one point trying to do food products from fish livers, uh, and we ran into a lot of parasite infest and yep. so that we couldn't do it. How are your cod in terms of, are there a potential for some food liver type products, patés yes. and chopped livers and things like that? Yes, we have six, I think, or seven canning facilities in Iceland, canning cod livers. And they're all very profitable industries. Uh, there are worms, obviously, in, but there are ways to get rid of the worms. They have some pre-processing techniques, actually using some enzymatic technologies. Uh, some trade secrets I can't, can't, can't go into. But the, uh, yeah, the livers uh, are being almost fully utilized in Iceland. We still have some of the factory trawlers that throw away the livers, which is horrible to say. But we, 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 I think the government's putting in legislation, actually, to have them bring the liver ashore so we have to do something with the liver. But the parasites, we, we do have some parasites in the liver. Uh, the mapping I showed you, we've actually mapped also the areas. So you can avoid those areas for, for liver, liver processing. And um, then one benefit that we have way up there in the north, we have less dioxins and some of those pollutants. 
that you will find more of when you go closer to Scandinavia and closer to, to England and Ireland. So, Are you doing anything more than just canning? I mean, real value added as opposed to the traditional yes, fish. Yes, well, fish oil. Yeah, we do uh, fish no, oil. No, I meant human food products like pâtés and things. Uh, well, these, yeah, these are actually, they're both canned whole and then they're also pâtés. And they're almost all exported to, uh, I think, France. France is a really big uh, consumer of those pâtés. They taste really good. You wouldn't believe they're from fish. I mean, they're really, really tasty. And you get an overdose of omega-3s when you eat them. So you, you don't have to, you, you can't eat too much of them. And take one more now, if you've got one more. Have we got one more? Or we will move on. Okay, let's give him a hand. Thank you. Next up, we have...